The Third Reich at War is the final book in Richard J. Evans' Third Reich series. It covers German history from the invasion of Poland in 1939 to the end of the war in 1945. This book is unique in that it focuses on life behind the scenes of the war rather than just the war itself. It helps us better understand the impact the war had on German society at all levels, from the political leaders and manufacturing industries to ordinary soldiers and civilians. It also goes in-depth on the conquest and genocide that accompanied the war. Some reviews of this book argue that there is not enough focus on the military side of things. I disagree. This book provides a much more holistic and comprehensive view of the war. It gives us a much wider perspective of World War II than we would get from a solely military perspective alone. These are my takeaways from the Third Reich at war. As the Third Reich began its invasions of the East and West, atrocities followed closely behind. The practice of organized murder and imprisonment that had been perfected in Germany were now implemented in its newly conquered territories. Many German military personnel were horrified at the crimes being committed, but only a few spoke out about it, and even fewer resisted it. On the Eastern Front in Poland, and later Russia, it was particularly bad. Many civilians were killed, imprisoned, or enslaved. Villages were regularly looted and burned to the ground. One Polish citizen remarked, Where is the traditional German sense of honor? I lived in Germany 13 years and no one cheated me. Now suddenly, they have become thieves. They empty houses of whatever meets their eye. As the German army advanced through Europe, the policies of sterilization and euthanasia continued their advance through Germany. Thousands of criminals, disabled, work shy, and other people deemed inferior by the government were sterilized or killed by the German medical establishment. From an initially small group of committed physicians, the circle of those involved had grown inexorably wider until general practitioners, psychiatrists, social workers, asylum staff, orderlies, nurses and managers, drivers, and many others have become involved. Through a mixture of bureaucratic routine, peer pressure, propaganda and inducements, and rewards of one kind or another. The largest murder of all, however, was the murder of the Jews. The Third Reich went above and beyond in its efforts to kill as many Jews as possible. They rounded them up in Germany, in all the countries they invaded, and even pressured their allies to hand over their Jewish populations. While there was still a level of secrecy to the whole operation, the sheer scale and aggressiveness of it all made it difficult to hide. Even for ordinary German civilians, it was not difficult to piece together what was being done to the Jews. One civilian who saw what was going on remarked, With this terrible murder of the Jews, we have brought upon ourselves an indelible disgrace, a curse that can never be lifted. One of the most significant turning points in World War II was the Battle of Stalingrad. It is widely considered to be the largest battle in human history. In the winter months between 1942 and 43, German and Russian soldiers fought a bitter battle of attrition in and around the destroyed city of Stalingrad. After several months, the Russians encircled the Germans, trapping them in the city. Conditions in this encircled pocket were appalling. Starvation and disease were rampant. Ammunition and equipment were scarce and the brutal Russian winter killed thousands of poorly dressed German soldiers. As hope of rescue began to fade, many soldiers found it within themselves to celebrate a hopeless Christmas that winter, despite their predicament. They celebrated by singing carols, making makeshift Christmas trees, and giving each other gifts. Of this Stalingrad Christmas, one German officer wrote, Despite everything, the little tree had so much Christmas magic and homely atmosphere about it that at first I couldn't bear the sight of the lighted candles. I was really affected to such an extent that I cracked up and had to turn my back for a minute before I could sit down with the others and sing carols in the wonderful sight of the candlelit tree. The defeat at Stalingrad had a profoundly negative impact on German public opinion. Throughout the battle, the propaganda ministry tried in vain to make it seem like Germany was winning, but thousands of letters sent home by the soldiers in Stalingrad painted a different picture. This first major loss for the German army combined with the firebombing of several large German cities spread disillusionment far and wide throughout Germany. There was still hope that the war could be won, but the confidence and optimism that had accompanied Germany's early victories were never felt again. A critical opinion of the regime began to spread and disparaging attitudes towards Hitler became more common. Hitler's charisma was beginning to fade. Regional party officials reported that jokes were beginning to circulate around him. What's the difference between the sun and Hitler, went one, to which the answer was, the sun rises in the east, Hitler goes down in the east. Even though life was getting progressively worse for the German population, there was still a common sentiment of collectivism and duty to Germany that kept people from rebelling. For most people, opposition towards the Nazi regime never developed past the level of private disillusionment. 
However, there were a select few who were more open in their opposition. The most famous example during this time was the July bomb plot. In 1944, a small group of German officers understood that Hitler was going to destroy Germany and they decided to try and stop him. They hoped to stage a coup and bring the war to an end, but they also wanted to prove to the world and future generations that not all Germans supported Hitler. After several failed assassination attempts, the group was finally able to sneak a bomb into Hitler's planning room at the Wolf's Lair headquarters. Unfortunately, this attempt also failed. Several people died in the explosion, but Hitler survived without serious injury. News of this event spread rapidly throughout Germany, and the Nazi administration cracked down hard on the conspirators. Those involved in the plot were executed or committed suicide. Hundreds of people connected to them were arrested and thrown in concentration camps. Even though the bomb plot failed, the courage and example of those involved succeeded in helping Germany forge a new moral identity after the war. As 1944 came to a close, the destruction of Nazi Germany was accelerating at an alarming pace. Carpet bombing of German cities increased, and Germany's military was fighting a losing battle on two fronts. Raw materials began to run out, and German war planners had to quickly adapt to keep the war machine moving. Large factories were moved underground or split up into smaller complexes that were camouflaged in forests. Many planes and vehicles were inoperable due to lack of fuel or spare parts. In the midst of these desperate circumstances, the Nazi government continued to allocate large amounts of valuable personnel and resources to the extermination of Jews. The obsessiveness with which the SS, aided by the local German civilian and military authorities, hounded the last Jews to their deaths, irrespective of any military or economic rationality, was a stark testimony to the primacy of anti-Semitic thinking in the ideology of the Third Reich. Despite the poor allocation of resources, German war industry showed remarkable resiliency. Destroyed factories were rebuilt and relocated in record time. Some production lines experienced their highest levels of output in the final months of the war, but the writing had been on the wall for a long time. German heads of industry were among the first people to realize that the war could not be won. They understood early on that the Allies were outproducing them on a large scale, but they had little choice but to continue on until lack of fuel and working railway lines made production impossible. By the first months of 1945, all of Germany's major cities and towns had been destroyed, but the fate of eastern Germany was still worse. The Red Army held nothing back as it took its revenge on the eastern German regions of Prussia, Silesia, and Pomerania. Towns and villages were burned to the ground and hundreds of thousands of women were raped. The flight and expulsion of eastern Germans to the west during this time is one of the largest movements of people in human history. These eastern German territories were quite literally erased from the map. The Russians eventually captured Berlin and Hitler committed suicide. A few days later, after years of fighting, the war officially came to an end. Millions of people were dead, and the face of Europe had been changed forever. I will end this video with what I think is the most important quote of Richard J. Evans' Third Reich series. The Third Reich at war primarily focused on German history during World War II, but in the closing lines of the book, Richard J. Evans writes, The legacy of the Third Reich is much wider. It extends far beyond Germany and Europe. The Third Reich raises in the most acute form the possibilities and consequences of the human hatred and destructiveness that exists, even if only in a small way, within all of us. It demonstrates with terrible clarity the ultimate potential consequences of racism, militarism, and authoritarianism. It shows what can happen if some people are treated as less human than others. It poses in the most extreme possible form the moral dilemmas we all face at one time or another in our lives of conformity or resistance, action or inaction in the particular situations with which we are confronted. That is why the Third Reich will not go away, but continues to command the attention of thinking people throughout the world long after it has passed into history. This concludes my takeaways from the Third Reich at War. Thank you for watching.